91.3 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. We are devoting this hour to the music of Sarah Parada. Her new release, Blue to Gold. We just heard track number one, The Other Side. And now let's get her on the line. And Sarah. Hi. Hi there. I have to start this off with a happy birthday. Thank you. That's so cool. I don't think I've ever done a show where I've spoken to somebody on their birthday. So pretty cool stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you mentioned this date and I felt like it would be nice to do on my birthday. Yeah, absolutely. And especially when you have a friend cooking dinner for you and you can just kind of kick back and, and enjoy the day as you should because you should be pampered on your birthday. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sarah Parada, singer, songwriter, pianist, your beautiful new album, which was produced by Jerry Marada, Blue to Gold. We just heard the track number one, The Other Side. We'll talk about your upcoming show, which will be on at uh, Colony in Woodstock on November 28th. But I always like to go back in time a little bit. And um, from what I understand, you were born into a very musical family, Yes. Yeah, um, everybody in my family plays music, and my grandfather taught me how to play piano when I was probably about four, oh. and um, yeah, everybody plays a lot of folk music, like banjo, my dad plays banjo, uh-huh. and my uncle played the fiddle, so there was a lot of folk and bluegrass music when I was a small child. And now where did you grow um, up? I grew up in Kerhonkson, New York. Wow, okay, so you are Hudson yeah. Valley born and bred. I wasn't born here, but I was, I was bred here. <laughs> <laughs> good place to be I, I bred. Up, I grew up here, yeah. Yeah, 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 really but good. Here. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Yeah, it's a kind of, I could say the same thing. I wasn't born here, but been here since, and it's, it's a beautiful place to be. Now, is it true that your mom also toured, like, singing folk music with her three sisters, and they call themselves the Power Sisters? Yeah, so their last name, my mother's maiden name is Power. And um, my aunt Kate Power, she lives in Portland, Oregon, yeah. and she's a pretty well-known folk musician in Portland with her husband Steve, and um, and they do a lot of touring. And my mother and her three sisters, they've always been singing folk harmony ever since I was born and before, Aww. and um, so that's just something that's been a big part of our family is singing right. and harmonizing with each other. So, um, yeah, they, so they did some tours together as the Power Sisters. Oh, my gosh. How much fun. How much fun. And your dad is like a luthier? Well, my dad is an engineer. He's a civil engineer, but he builds guitars. Um, he has a big workshop, and he's been building guitars and ukuleles and banjos and dulcimers and Just, all sorts of things. Wow, like for fun <laughs> on like the side. Things. For fun, for like as a hobby, it takes him a long time to build them. So, if he was to sell them, it wouldn't really make much sense, right? Because right. he wouldn't really make his money back. It's really just he does it out of love, and he does it for our family. Like he he's built us some instruments, and oh. he he gives them as gifts, and then he has a collection at his house of ones that he's built. Wow, that's really special. Yeah, it's and his instruments are beautiful. They're really well made. I bet. I bet. I bet he takes this time and you know when you don't have to do it for money and you're just doing it for love, time time doesn't matter, right? It's not like you're trying to, you know, rush it to get it to somebody. It's just whenever it gets done, it gets done. So, pretty cool. Right. Pretty cool. Now, where did you go to school since you grew up in Kerhonkson? So, I went to Rondout. Mhm. Mhm. I ended up marrying um, the biology teacher's son. <laughs> so, um, so Ron Parada is the infamous biology teacher at Rondout, and his son Jay is my husband. Oh, that's so sweet. And did you guys meet while you were at Rondout? No, uh, we had mutual friends. He went to Red Hook. So oh, my yeah. husband also grew up in the area. Yeah, me too. I went um, to Red Hook too. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Now, music at Rondout. Um, they had music program there, yes? Yeah, so they had, um, so Russell Henzey was the choir director then. And I did, like, all the, like, jazz band and area all state and all that stuff in school. And I ended up going to Europe with, um, through all state, I auditioned for oh. 
the Honor Choir of America. Whoa. And when I was 15 or 16, 15, I think, we went to um, Europe and we went, we sang in all these cathedrals. So we sang at St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, Italy, and La Sacre Coeur in Paris, and um, oh. all over in five different countries. And it was it was really fun, except I had to wear like a little bow tie and <laughs> uh, like this collared shirt, and then I'd get in trouble if I unbuttoned my shirt. <laughs> and you all had to wear the same thing, I assume? Yeah, it was like very formal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, that what a great opportunity. And so young. Now, piano, you took that in school. When did you start singing? Because your voice is obviously um, sounds beautiful. And it's trained. And you're just I mean, your voice sounds as good as your piano playing. When did the voice come into play? So I mean, because my my mother and her sisters were always singing. So I would just I was always encouraged to sing or I just always loved singing. And it was just something I always did. Um, and did you uh, study I voice, to, or did you? St- well, I, yeah, I studied. Um, so I went to SUNY New Paltz, and I studied jazz. Mm-hmm. And voice was my principal instrument. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. SUNY also good, good, uh, good jazz program there. That's for sure. Yeah. Lots of great teachers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great school. It's really small. It wasn't my first choice. I wanted to go to Berkeley College of Music, but. We couldn't afford it, and yeah. I ended up reluctantly going to SUNY New Paltz, but then really, really loved it and felt like I was so blessed to go there, and I met so many great friends. They're still my friends. Actually, the bass player in my band right now, um, we were in a jazz program together, so there was maybe like 20 other people that were in the jazz studies program, so we had like a pretty close-knit community of musicians that were all studying the same things. So it felt really good. It was like family. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes things happen for a reason. You may not have figured it out at that moment, but that's exactly where you were supposed to be. So, yeah. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, So what were you listening to when you were a teenager? Oh, I, well, I, I liked um, Pink Floyd. I liked all the classic rock of the Mm seventies. So um, I didn't listen to that. So I grew up in the nineties. So like Nirvana and Pearl Jam and the Indigo Girls and Sarah McLachlan, they were all like the popular music of the time. And I listened to that a little bit, but I listened more to music from the 1970s. Uh-huh. Nice. Interesting. Interesting. And then going to school, obviously studying jazz, um, who were some of your jazz influences? So um, I really liked cool jazz more than like bebop Mm -hmm. i i liked the more laid back jazz and then um as a singer i was encouraged to sing all the standards so of course i loved billy holiday nina simone is one of my favorites oh yeah Uh uh-huh um and i mean there's so many but I, i also love like the standard like I love I love Frank Sinatra, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, that's considered jazz, I guess, but it's more like standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, timeless. I mean, Sinatra is gonna, people are going to talk about him in fifty and a hundred years. He's timeless. You know, I think right. kind of like the Beatles too. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah. And when did you? How old were you when you released your your debut album, Drink the Sky? Uh, I think I was about nineteen. Ah, so still in college. So, yeah, I was in college. I was studying jazz, and I released the record but the record was completely different than anything I was studying so I (laughs) like I studied classical piano and then I studied jazz theory and voice and then my first record was kind of like um influenced by electro pop music so I met these two guys Carl and Harvey Harvey Jones and Carl Adami and they had this band called Quiet City and it was like an electro pop instrumental band and they were playing in New York City a lot and they were showcasing and they were they were trying to get people's attention but it like it was beautiful music but they didn't have a singer and they weren't really like attracting people to listen to it I think because people wanted a singer to focus on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so then they um they were auditioning singers I was 17 they were like 35 or 40 they were like a lot older than me yeah and so they auditioned me, and 
it, the audition went really great. I just improvised through the whole audition, and they were like, it's perfect. We love it. So then um, I started working with them, and then Harvey, who is a synth player, he ended up going to England, where he's from, and spending a lot of time there. And Carl and I were just here, and so we just kept working together, and then we we wrote and recorded my first record, which was under the band name Out Loud Dreamer, which is, it was a duo between myself and Carl. Oh, nice. Out Loud Dreamer. I love that name. That's great. Drink the Sky. And it got critical acclaim, too, for your first... Yeah, we did. We did really well. People loved it. It got a lot of, um, we had a lot of fans and... It got in some rock climbing documentaries. I was working at the Mohawk Preserve at the time as a forest ranger. Oh, my gosh. And um, there, so I was friends with a lot of the rock climbers. And I ended up, um, I'd ended up getting into the hands of this woman who worked for ASCAP. Yeah. And she put it on an ASCAP compilation. And then um, it was interesting because the rock climbing community actually, like, gave me a bunch of of great little moments in my career at that time. So, um, so then it got into a couple of different rock climbing documentaries and that was internationally distributed. So we ended up getting this great following of rock climbers who like loved the music. Amazing. Amazing. And changing identities also with, uh, Mm -hmm. narrated by Meryl Streep, nonetheless. Yeah. Wow. That was, um, a friend of mine did an art, like an art documentary on people that had traumatic injury and like healing through art. And they used my music as a backdrop and then Meryl Streep narrated it with her amazing voice. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like for you hearing her narrate that? Um, it, it was, it was really cool. I mean, I just, I love her voice. She's so people like that. You feel like you know them because you've heard their voice so many times. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's cool. Yeah, it is cool. Absolutely. Oh, Sarah, nice. And um, and then I, I I did not know this about you until I started doing some research. But um, your affiliation and your friendship with um, the legendary Garth Hudson. Yeah. So uh, with him, I so after Outload Dreamer, I um, so Carl, the bass player, ended up moving to Las Vegas. He had a him and his wife had a baby. And then he got this good job in Las Vegas doing sound and he moved. And I was kind of like in dismay, like this band that I loved so much couldn't play together anymore. And it was kind of the end of that. And I was trying to figure out what else to do. And um, I was playing a little bit solo, but I was feeling really down. Mm -hmm. And I went to the dentist and my dentist was, uh, cleaning my teeth and was really tired and was saying, oh, I'm living this double life as a trumpet player and a dentist. Oh, my gosh. And, and I, I didn't get any sleep last night because we had this gig. And so, like, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm, like, really tired and I'm kind of freaking out because he's, like... He's in your like, mouth, right? In my mouth. <laughs> and then he's saying, oh, I'm playing in this big band. It's really cool. And uh, Garth Hudson from the band is in it, but he's always on tour and... Like, we haven't seen him in a while, and he hasn't been able to come to the last couple of gigs, and we're really missing a piano player, and we need a piano player. And I was, like, talking to him while I had all the stuff in my mouth and saying, well, I play piano, and I, I, like, I know jazz. And then he was like, you should come and, and sit in with us, and when Garth is out of town, you should come and, and play, because we just need somebody there at the rehearsals anyway, or, like, just come by. So then I came, I started coming to the rehearsals and then Garth was away for a long time. So I ended up like doing a bunch of gigs with them and going to the rehearsal every week and playing this big band jazz stuff, which is so joyful and so fun. And And what was the name of this band? It was the Big Blue Big Band. The Big Blue Big Band. Okay. And so um, it was, it was fun and it was fun for me because I knew the jazz theory so I could utilize my knowledge and play with these guys and then one day um garth came to the rehearsal and i was there also and they weren't sure if he was going to come but then he ended up coming and so that day i sat aside and garth sat down at the piano and i turned pages for him Mm -hmm. and he was so funny and he was so charming and interesting and at one point he like he was hilarious because there were so many pages 
for the music and he ended up like the music fell off the the stand and then he ended up picking it up and turning it upside down and like he wasn't even really following the changes he was just like pretty much improvising uh-huh. through all the songs but it sounded so amazing because he's Garth Hudson right. and so then I ended up going to like then I ended up being his page turner for a few rehearsals and I really liked him and I had so much fun just listening to him play and interpret the music and then um at one point I asked him if he would teach me a piano lesson so then he started coming to my house and he would come really late so he has um he's in he's he has narcolepsy. So yes. He falls asleep all the time, but he also is nocturnal, yep. and he pretty much sleeps during the day, and then he comes, he does stuff at night. So we would say, like, okay, let's get together at 7 o'clock, and then he would call every single time. He would call and say, oh, I'm running a little behind. I'll be there soon. <laughs> and then, like, another hour would go by, and I'd just be like, okay, when is he going to come? And I had a job oh, no. in the morning, oh. but, like, I didn't really care because it was Garth right. Hudson coming to my house. Right. And then he would pretty much always come at around midnight. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So yeah. we would have, like, midnight rambles yeah. at my house. And he would just talk about music and all these stories and all of his influences. And he would play all this stuff. And I would record the the lessons because they weren't really, like, your typical piano lesson. They weren't. It was really just him talking about his his music and playing, and we would go over some songs, but it was more it was more like me learning about him and how he played. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you still have so, those recordings, yeah? I do, yeah. Wow, wow, that's pretty special to have. Yeah, I wanted at one point I wanted to do something with them, like maybe I don't know, like at some point I thought maybe I would somehow like maybe write a book or something or but I just never have done that <laughs> right right yeah no it, it would be something amazing I've uh, had the opportunity to um, sit with him and he is so unique and you feel like I felt like I was in the presence of like a legend I could feel it from him yeah you know and and genius. S- such a genius and and he was on the b3 then he had the roads then there's a grand piano and he just uh-huh. moves from one to the next like at, like s- just beautiful to watch a true master a true master I know yeah, 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 it's really yeah. inspiring. Yeah, yeah, oh, great. And he recorded with you your the well. Is that your second release? Your second album? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So mm-hmm. he played. Um, I actually wrote a song for him on that record that he plays on, and then he played. So he played on two songs on that record. Wow! Wow! He and, played accordion. Oh, that's so great! That's so mm-hmm. great! Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, on that well there too, you also picked up renowned bassist Tony Levin. Yeah. Wow. How'd you hook up with Tony? Tony, um, So Tony, we, so we didn't have a bass player. So Carl left and then I did the big band thing. And then at that same time, I decided that I just needed to keep playing music. I needed to get a band back together. I was doing some solo shows, but I, I really love the collaboration of a band. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to put my live band back together from what Carl and I had put together without Carl. Mm -hmm. So then we were lacking a bass player and, um, I felt like, like I couldn't fill that role so easily because Carl was so important to me and we had worked so closely together that it was hard to just like pick up another bass player because he was such a part of my music. So we just went into the recording studio without a bass player and we were I don't even know what we were thinking. I think we were just like, oh, we'll just play without a bass player. And then we started recording and we were like, we need a bass player. Like, who are we going to get? It just was evident that all the songs needed bass. Uh So then um, I just said, because I love Tony Levin's playing and I knew that he lived around here. And I just said like on a whim, like let's get Tony Levin, but I didn't even really mean it. Like I didn't think that that was Mm -hmm. possible. I just kind of said it. And then the engineer said, um, Oh, I was just at a party with him. He's amazing. And he (laughs) gave me his number and he said that like, if I have any projects that we need a bass player for, I should call him. So like, this is amazing timing and like, we should just call him. So we called him and we 
gave him some demos. And, and he, he was actually it. in town because that's a tough one with Tony Levin. He was in town and he was like so kind and responsive and like came right out and he brought all of his bases, like all these, all the ones that he played with Peter Gabriel and he brought his funk fingers and he brought, um, the stick. Everything. Yeah. The stick, the, stick, and the Chapman stick. Yeah. And, um, so we, we did that record. We started it with the live band. So we did all the tracks as the live band, so drums, guitar, bass, and piano. And then I did like a rough vocal. And so we did, we tracked everything with Tony for like two or two days or three days. I can't remember, but they were long days. And he just, he, he was so generous and awesome and funny and just like immediately became a part of the band. And immediately we were like focused and, it just gelled and he like, I mean, just his playing anchors everything in because he's such a phenomenal bass player. Right. Right. It yeah. brought everything to this whole other level, having him on board. You can't get more professional than Tony Levin. Yeah. He's a master. Yeah. 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 No, he's got it together for sure. When I had him on my show, I remember saying, I'm like, Tony, you can pick like four or five tracks. I'm like, yeah, right. I mean, come on, the guys played on everything. And he decided, and this was so smart, he came up with a CD, a compilation of things he worked on, and he did snippets of it, maybe 20, 30 Mm -hmm. seconds of each track. He filled up six minutes. And there was still more to go. It was incredible. You wouldn't even believe all the stuff he was on. I was like, I didn't know that was you. I didn't know that was you. Yeah, no, he's he's great. He's That's really so cool. Great. And he also so um, played on your third album also, yes? Yeah, so my third album, I had a band, I had a trio, and it was just myself, a guitarist, and a drummer. So we were doing that live, and then I would play the Rhodes piano, and then I had a Moog synthesizer, a mini Moog synthesizer, and I would... I would play all the bass lines on my left hand on the Moog and it sounded really cool for live shows. But when we went in to record, it was the same thing where it was like, ah, it's not that electric bass sound. It's not like it's the Moog is really cool, but it has this glow to it and it doesn't have the precision of the bass and it's not like landing on the beat all the time. Like it's like kind of got this like woo sound <laughs> instead of like, like a, a bass where it like punctuates everything. So we just felt like we really needed bass. And since I had worked with Tony before, we were like, Oh, we got to get Tony again. Cause he's best. So we were rec- for that one. We recorded everything as our trio. Cause we had actually, we didn't plan on having bass. We just, we recorded everything with the trio with the Moog. Mm-hmm. And then when we went in to start overdubbing we were, and listening back to it, we were like, Oh, we need a bass. We need more but Tony then- Levin. We need more Tony. <laughs> so we sent him all the tracks and he did it at his home studio and he just, he did a phenomenal job on that record too. Oh, of course. Of course. There, there would never be anything less with him. And not only that, your new release, Sarah, Blue to Gold. Hello, you got Tony again. Yeah, well, of course, because he's like Jerry Murata's right-hand man. Right, right, right. They're besties. And, uh, yeah, so yeah. that was also, I felt like it just deepened my whole experience that I had, I already had this connection with Tony and then meeting Jerry, it felt like it just kind of like everything kind of fell into place in this really, really inspiring way. Did you, did Tony introduce you to Jerry Morata? No. So no. I, um, I was playing I played accordion at the Bear Cell Theater for a concert with Jane Sibbery. Hold on a second. You played accordion. Right. So actually, Garth Hudson taught me how to play accordion. Of course he did. Oh, my God. That's great. And, and so I have this little, like, he, I, I actually have a big accordion that he was teaching me on, but it was too big for me because I'm a small person. Yeah. And I, I couldn't really, like handle it (laughs) so I I got this little tiny student accordion and um and every once in a while I I brush the dust off of it and play it and um so I was I actually was singing back up for Jane Sibiri and then she asked if I would play accordion 
or she, I think she said she needed accordion, and then I brought my accordion to one of the rehearsals, and then she was like, yeah, do that. And so then Jerry was playing drums, and I was playing accordion, and we just got to talking, and he asked me what I was doing, and I said I was working on, that I'm a songwriter, I'm, I'm looking to record my next record, and he said he could help me. So then we started getting together at Dreamland, and I'd play him my songs on the piano, and we did a lot of pre-production. We, like, got together a lot, and I just played him my songs for, like, a year Wow. Before we actually started recording anything. Mm-hmm. And he was also super busy. He'd be going on tour, coming back. So we only would get together every once in a while. But it was kind of like this thing that was starting to build. And then um, it took us a long time. I was kind of like the back burner project for Jerry for like five years. <laughs> so he was working on touring with the security project and recording all these things and managing Dreamland. And then whenever there was a space um, in the schedule at Dreamland and they didn't have anybody coming in, he would book me to come in and we would just work on my record. And and, and you know what? It, it is worth the wait. I know it took a long time, but this album, when you listen to it, it really is so beautifully done and um, it's very eloquent and elegant. It's not overproduced. It's just really beautifully done really congratulations sarah on this um fourth release of yours blue to gold and uh tell us about um the musicians that you have on here of course jerry Murata on drums tony levin you mentioned on bass who else is joining you on this so sarah lee is also on bass Fantastic. Um, sarah lee from the b52s and gang of four and she was our neighbor for a long time she's one of our dear friends and she also happens to have a long history with Jerry playing bass with Jerry. So um, she plays, I think she plays on like half of the record and Tony plays on almost half the record. Uh And then Jerry actually plays bass on one one or two songs. Really? I think so. Jerry is a phenomenal bass player. Who knew? Oh my God, I'd love to see that. I know. (laughs) <laughs> wow yeah well we'll have to do yeah. that sometime is uh get jerry to play a bass when he's out playing on his show that'd be awesome to see i'd love that yeah, yeah. he's so good because he's so so specific right in what he likes about bass because he's a, an amazing drummer and he's worked with so many bass players so he has a very specific taste uh-huh yeah in bass playing and um and of course he's been influenced a bit by tony but he has his own sound, and he's really melodic and wonderful, wow. really wonderful. Wow. Bass. So three different bass players on this. And then on guitar, you have quite a few guitarists on here also. Yeah. So uh, Mark Schulman, who is Suzanne Vega's guitarist, and um, Bill Dillon, who is, he worked a lot with Robbie Robertson. Mm-hmm. He's from Canada. So he does this amazing slide solo on Echo of Joy. And then Mark does, Mark, we hired Mark for most of the guitar on the record. Um, also, Jerry Leonard yeah. plays guitar on a song that Pamela Suman, his wife, co-produced. Oh, nice. With Jerry. So she's one of my dear friends. And um, her and I were working together with Donna Lewis. We had a little side project. Oh, I think I remember that. this. You guys played at the Falcon together. Yeah, we played at the Falcon, we played at the Colony, we played at BSP. Yeah, yeah. Um, just kind of doing some local shows together, and it was so fun. I love both of them so much. They're both amazing musicians and songwriters, and it was really fun, too, to be working with other women yeah, that yeah. are musicians, and um, we would back each other up, so each one of us would play, like, a third of the set, and then we'd back each other up on on the other songs. So like Pam would use me and Donna as her backing band and I would use the two of them as my backing band. Oh, nice. Yeah, no, that works. And out. Have a, it was so fun. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And is that your husband also playing on guitar? Yes, of no. course. Yes. Yeah, so and my husband plays guitar on, um, on a few, a couple of songs. Uh huh. And, um, and then my friend Johnny, who is my guitar player for my last record plays guitar in one song too. Beautiful. And now he's in my live band. Johnny's playing in my live band now. Wow, wow, wow. That, this is so great. Now, the songs, how long, 
they were all written at separate times. How long did it take you to write them, and why the order that they are? Oh, God. <laughs> so I'm always writing songs, and um, I haven't released a record in a long time. I haven't released a record in 10 years. I became a mother when I released my last record. I My third record, I, w- I was eight months pregnant when I released that, and I thought that it was going to be easy to continue to play gigs and to keep releasing records after I became a mom, and it was not easy. And um, I just had, I put together several bands, but like I have two children, so I put together a band, and then like a couple years later I got pregnant again, and then like it just kept on, it was just hard to keep, focus oh sure absolutely I can understand that yeah yeah so um so then uh what was the question oh how like the songwriting so the so- these songs have all been kind of, like some of them have been kicking around for a long time for like 10 years and then they've just been I write a lot but they're these were the ones that kind of like surfaced when working with Jerry and playing him my songs these were the ones we landed on to record yeah yeah so yeah. Yeah. And we had some other ideas, too. Like, we had explored some of We just didn't finish all of them, and then we were like, okay, this is enough. Like, this is this is good. This is a record, and we're, we have to, like, rein it in because we were in exploratory mode for so long. It was just like, oh, let's try this, and let's try that. And then it was like, okay, we just have to, like, get a record out. We've been working on this for a long time. Let's just finish it. So the nine songs that are on the record are the ones that we actually finished. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Well, you, uh, I'm sure you have enough for another one at some point to come out with. And, um, yeah, so I'm ready. I'm ready to, like, yeah, start working st- on the next start one. Start all over again. Blue to Gold is this release. It can be found, I'm assuming, wherever you stream music from. Also, I always try to get people to buy from the artist directly. If you're still old school like me, you have a beautiful yeah. CD out, com, as well as social media. What I love about CDs and not down loads is like I get to see the lyrics I get to see who's on the credits um, where it's recorded you don't see this stuff when you're just downloading it you know and it's just better quality and we have we also printed it on vinyl oh yes on vinyl and the vinyl is like really really nice it's um, my friend Mike Amari he did all the layout and my friend Rachel Brennicky did the photography and they're all they're both local really great people and uh, we had it pressed in Austin, Texas with this company that's owned by all women. Oh, wow. Great. And they gave me a great deal on the uh, 180 gram vinyl. So it's like this, this thick, really good quality vinyl. And it has, it's like a translucent blue with a gold swirl in it. And it's, it's pretty stellar. It is pretty stellar. And I'm assuming you'll have some of these for sale uh, at your show on November 28th at Colony. Yes, we will. Oh, nice. And tickets available, colonywoodstock.com. Who will you have joining you on November 28th? So I have my live band, which is all people that I've known and worked with for a really long time. And I'm really excited about this band. I feel like we're a family. And I have Manuel Quintana on drums. Mm -hmm, Fantastic. Um, Really fantastic drummer. He plays with so many people, so many amazing artists, and uh, Johnny Wong on guitar, who is my guitarist for my previous album, and Jesse Tui, who I studied jazz with at New Paltz, is on bass, and he's phenomenal, and then I have my friend Megan Gugliata playing violin on a few songs. Oh, beautiful. Wow. Oh, my gosh. This sounds wonderful. November 28th. Colony Woodstock is the place to be Sunday evening. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Oh, this is great. And Colony is such a beautiful sound system and such a great venue right in the heart of Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah. I know. They've been really keeping it going through COVID. They're one of the few venues in the area that's had music like all through COVID. And it's been inspiring. Every time I go to Woodstock, there's music outside. And it just feels like they're the heart of Woodstock. They're keeping music alive in the area and it's really 
inspiring. It is inspiring. Fun. It's they've been working their asses off there at uh, Colony. I tell you that, and it really is such a cool vibe out there. All the great picnic tables, and they invested so much into a beautiful stage outside, and the sound yeah. system is killer. The food, the libation, the whole thing. Now, of course, it's a little chilly. Bringing it well, inside. inside. Yes, yeah, you're bringing inside. it inside. And I do want to say that, um, especially on local motion, um, I will tell you that every venue that I discuss here does have pro- uh, COVID safety protocols, and that is the case yeah. at Colony Woodstock. So, yes, yeah, so we have to be vaccinated, and um, everybody. Actually, I went to a concert on Sunday, and it was great. It was uh, Sandrine, who uh-huh. is Malcolm Burns' wife. And uh, Peter Aaron, they have this oh, yeah. band, The Heartless Hearts. It's really fun. It's like punky, and the songs are great. They're like, it's like poppy, punky, and it, they have such a good chemistry, the two of them. Oh, fun. Uh, so I just saw them there, and that was a Sunday night, and it was a really cool vibe. Um, it is a cool yeah, vibe, and you feel safe, right? Because you're masked. I felt you're, really safe. Yeah. Well, they actually, once you're inside, they like, they're very diligent about making sure that everybody's vaccinated and yep. all of that. But then once you're inside and there's people at the bar and they, people weren't wearing masks, but everybody has been, everybody's been screened before they go in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody is, yeah. And that's, yeah. That, uh, you know, nowadays this is unfortunately the world we live in and we have to stay safe. So um, yeah. kud- kudos to Colony uh, Woodstock for being one of those venues in the area that take this stuff uh, seriously and want to keep their artists, their musicians and themselves and their staff safe. So good for them. Good for them. Definitely. Sarah, it's your birthday. You need to go celebrate. It's, birthday. it's your birthday. <laughs> and everybody can celebrate with you at Colony on November 28th. They can get tickets at ColonyWoodstock.com. And they can check out your music at SarahParadaMusic.com, as well as social media. <coughs> I say buy a CD directly from the artist at the show. How's that work? Yeah. yeah. I'm also uh, playing at uh, Radio Woodstock. On Monday, the 22nd, they're having a, we're doing a live stream event in the steeple session. Oh, nice. So nice. Radio Woodstock just ran, they moved from the Bearsville Complex to a church on Route 28. It's so gorgeous. Oh, nice. And Lovely. They have a whole stage in there, and uh, we're going to do like a special concert, um, an interview that's going to be on air and also live streamed. And it's, um, 50 people are allowed to come that are Radio Woodstock supporters. So I'm not exactly sure how that works. If they're like, I think there are people that are maybe in, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe if it, advertisers there's a, there's a or something or people that donate, be, something like that. But they could go to the website and probably have info yeah, on that there. There's a little link and it says get tickets and then they're free. But you can go to, I think you can go to Radio Woodstock and, and catch up catch our set there. Oh, wonderful, Monday. wonderful. And go see you live um, with more than 50 people at Colony Woodstock on November yeah. 28th. So you got a couple of shows coming up. Congratulations on this beautifully done CD. I look forward to the next one. And um, yeah, we're going to play a few more tracks of this. We'll start off now with Echo of Joy. Tell me just a little bit about that, if you would. So this one has Bill Dylan, who is Robbie Robertson's guitarist uh, on Guitorgan, which is like a guitar organ, and uh, slide guitar, and also guitar. And then, um, yeah, and then Jerry and I doing, I'm doing the vocals, and we do backup vocals together, and um, Jerry does this amazing bass intro in the beginning of this song. I can't wait. Now, when I know this is Jerry Murata on bass, it's going to be, I never knew that. You live well, and Sarah learn. Lee is, Sarah Lee's playing bass through most of the song, through, but uh, Jerry's doing this really beautiful melodic bass intro. Beautiful. Well, listen, tell Sarah Lee I said hello, and I'm trying to get her on this show one of these days. I would love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, tell her to contact me, will you? And, okay, um, I will, sure. But most importantly, um, Enjoy the rest of your birthday and your dinner with your friends and family and kids and husband and all those people that love you. Happy, happy birthday, Sarah. Thank you for spending you. some time of it today with us here on Local Motion. And um, I wish you all the very best. And I hope to see you again soon. 
Thanks, Rita. You're welcome. Happy birthday. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. 91.3 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Sarah Parada, new music, Blue to Gold. Let's take a listen to track number two, titled Echo of Joy, right now on 91.3. Again, if I could only play that part again, I would take it in the heart again. It never happens the same way, we'll never live the same day. You could break this hold on me. your laugh in the echo of the joy
91.3 WVKR, brand new music. The track is called Echo of Joy. Sarah Parada's new release, Blue to Gold, produced by Jerry Marada, recorded at Dreamland Recording Studios up in Woodstock. Sarah will be performing at Colony in Woodstock on November 28th, colonywoodstock.com. You can also visit Sarah's website, sarahparadamusic.com get information and keep up with all her wonderful music and shows coming up and uh, hopefully she'll be touring this spring and I'm just going to keep playing another track or two we're here till 6 o'clock you are tuned into Local Motion here on 91.3 WVKR Independent Radio Poughkeepsie, New York if you haven't already please consider or if you've missed the interview you can always listen to it I probably won't be able to upload it tonight but tomorrow I'll be having the interview with Sarah up on YouTube as well as um, wherever you stream your podcasts from and the Local Motion Facebook page. So give a subscribe to any one of those and you'll be able to listen if you missed part of that interview. And also just a heads up before I forget, I will not be here next week. Um, Mark will be doing, Mark Breslov, our community DJ here, who's been doing his show on WVKR for many, 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 many years decades. He will be doing his annual tradition the night before Thanksgiving. He hosts like, a, I don't know, a four or five hour show or something. So that will be happening in place of local motion. Um, so I will not be here. So I'll wish you all a happy Thanksgiving now and um, tell you that when I return in two weeks for show number 299, I can't believe I'm saying this and I haven't yet announced it, but I'm going to be announcing it right now. My guest will be the legendary, renowned, world-class drummer, Mr. Jack DeJanette. Wow. Okay. So yeah, he's going to be the guest here on Local Motion for show number 299. And soon, soon I'll be announcing my guests for show number 300, which will happen on the 8th of December. So lots of good stuff. It's been a great year here for Local Motion, that's for sure. Let's keep the music going now with another track from Sarah Parada. This is called The Wilderness, 91.3 WVKR. Oh, 
The Wilderness, Sarah Parada's new release titled Blue to Gold, track number three. Thank you to Sarah for spending some time on her birthday with us here on Local Motion. If you missed part of that interview, everything will be uploaded on YouTube as well as Local Motion Facebook page and wherever you do your streaming from. I will not be here next week. I wish everybody a wonderful holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. We've got a lot to be grateful for. And I'll be back in two weeks where my guest will be the legendary Jack DeJanette. So going to go out with a track. Dr. J is in the house taking over the airwaves at 6 p.m. with Irie Groove. Let's take a listen to this last track from Sarah called Heartbeat, sarahparadamusic.com, as well as her show at Colony in Woodstock on November 28th. Tickets available, colonywoodstock.com. And here's the final track. We'll catch you in two weeks. Happy Thanksgiving. Until next time, peace. (laughs) 